Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Son. And Lord God, help us. Holy Spirit, help us with understanding and discernment to, to really comprehend what that freedom is, what that freedom looks like within our lives, Lord, because I know, as well as everyone here knows, there's, there's a counterfeit freedom that is out there. And it's really bondage from the enemy. So Lord God, help us to understand what true freedom in Jesus Christ actually is looks like. Father, thank you that we get to gather here today in your house with your body, Jesus, and, and worship you. Lord, what a great, what a great thing it is that we can come together and, and worship. Lord God, we get to hang out, we get to see friends, we get to have conversations, and that's such good edification for the body. But most of all, we get to come together and we get to exalt your holy name. So Lord, thank you for that. Today as we step into a, a time where we're going to study your word, Lord God, we just ask that you open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds. Help us to have the ability to receive the, the desire to receive what you have for each one of us. Not to shut down, not to daydream, not to close off, but to open ourselves up to you. Jesus, we pray for those that are sick. Lord God, with the illness that's going around, Lord God, we ask for a healing in their life. Lord, those that are um, emotionally going through things, Lord God, we ask for a touch on their life. Jesus, we ask that you touch Zeke. Lord God, however that needs to look in your wisdom, Lord God, we believe that you want to do something amazing. Lord God, however that may look, Lord God, we lift up the family, how hard it would be to be in that situation, the days just run into each other. So Lord God, we lift the family up as well. Lord God, we lift this body up, we lift this church up. Lord, you're doing, you're doing things. You're touching lives and Lord God, we want more of that. So thank you for trusting us enough with the people who you are bringing here. Lord God, we don't want to be outside of you on anything. So Jesus, be glorified once again. Continue to work. Continue to minister. Continue to be blessed. We pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. And everyone shout it out. Amen. You guys can be seated. All right. Everybody doing good? On this nice March day? You know, everywhere else I've ever lived, March is different than here. That's okay, though. We wouldn't want things to be like everywhere else, would we? Hey, I'm going to dismiss the kids right now. Kids, you can go on down. Kids by age. Like biologic age, not like anything. Yeah, we'll keep the more of the adults up here. Um, that's good. We love that. Um, we're a church that's young in heart. And maturity sometimes, but but that's that's good. A couple quick announcements we have. Um, the today after service will be the first anointed hands um, meeting in the basement. If you want to learn sign language, it's kind of cool, huh? Some people learn it for all different reasons. Amy was just saying how we should learn it so you know when we're out with people we can talk to each other and them not know what we're saying 
Wouldn't that be fun? Or in an elevator or something, and people get all nervous and stuff. No, it's a good thing to, uh, to, 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 to all sorts of good reasons to learn sign language, but that will be right after service in the basement. Cindy, of course, will be teaching that. And also on Sunday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, everybody wear green if you want, but you don't have to. You'll be sitting in green chairs. But right after service, we're going to have a, a, a wedding shower. We got a wedding coming up, don't we? Rachel and Shello. So the wedding shower will be the 17th right after service. Um, there's more in the bulletin on that. I'm not even going to try to say what to do or anything because I'll get it wrong. And then the ladies in the church will be like, Jason, you said that wrong. And so I just won't say anything. Just remember, March 17th after service, be here, right? Wear green. Bring presents wrapped in green. Green bring, bring green presents. Green food. No, we don't need any of that, but we're going to have fun. We're going to celebrate what, a, what an awesome couple this is. Love both of those people right there. Um, and then we have, so what it's going to look like, of course, we have a lot coming up here, don't we? So we're going to um, Passover Sunday, we're going to be looking at really maybe a timeline of what, what's going on in, in the, in the uh, time of Holy Week and things like that. Sometimes it's hard to really grasp all the dates and times and everything. So we're going to look at that, and then we're going to have a Good Friday service. That'll be March 29th. That'll be 6 p.m. here, and it'll be a shorter service. It won't be a full service. Um, probably in and out within an hour probably. And then Sunday, March 31st, which is Resurrection Sunday. Of course, the service is at 10. We're going to have brunch before that here at the church. So plan on getting here 8 to 8.30. So you have time to really load up and eat and everything. And we're just going to hang out with each other. Since that's the last Sunday of the month, we'll do brunch instead of the, the potluck afterwards. Um, the title of this, the, you know, these couple couple messages is death and life, the vital importance of the cross and the resurrection. How many of you guys know this is a really important time to invite people? How many of you guys are going to invite people? How many of you guys just want to invite people that sometimes come to church here, right? We want to make sure they feel welcome. We want to get as many people here to hear the message, the, the transforming message of, of both the death of Jesus as well as the life of Jesus. So it's not too early to be throwing that out there, to put that bug in people's ear, to just try to get him here on that Friday night and that Sunday morning. And um, if they have to choose one, that's fine, but try to encourage them to come to both. And then we have a new thing going on. It's called the Blessing Bowl. The Blessing Bowl. It's just a way to share what God is doing in your life. So in the, on the table right below the TV, there's a bowl and, and a little stand with cards and, and a little instruction. All you do is write down what God has done in your life, something that God is something amazing, right? We need to share that more often. Sometimes if we don't share it, we don't realize how big of a thing that is that Jesus has done in our life. So you just write on there, you can put your name on it, or you don't have to. It can be, you know, anonymous, whatever. And then on the last Sunday's potluck, we're going to be able to read those, right? So we can, we can share in that. So please participate in that. Um, if you're like, man, I want to, but God's not doing anything in my life. You got to open your eyes. You got to position yourself because God so wants to do things in our life. And from the biggest things to the smallest things, the more we acknowledge that first to him and thank him for that, the more we, we understand and comprehend just how much God is actually working in each one of our lives. Amen. Do you find that to be true? I totally find that to be true. All right. I think that's it for announcements. I, I can't think of any more. I do not think. I probably forgot some, so look at your emails and your bulletins and all that. Um, right now, ministries, that's still going on. Again, if you haven't received the, the code or anything, talk to Bruce. If you have and you've been in there, oh my goodness, there is so much stuff. 
Um, and there is so much good stuff. So participate in that. Uh, four ways to give, right? We pray for, we prayed for him. Um, continue to keep Zeke in your, your prayers. If you want to give, um, you can use the pull down menu on the online giving, or you can designate it um, when you mail it or use the giving box or, or anything. But you can text your giving. Um, you can do it online through our app or just online. You can do the giving boxes. You can mail it. Giving is an amazing thing, isn't it? Giving is an amazing thing. It's, it's a weird thing. Isn't giving weird? Like when you first come to, to Jesus and you first come to church, um, I, I remember one time we were in, we were at a Taekwondo tournament for Levi. And I think we were in Little Rock, Arkansas. And and uh, this guy sits down next to me, and, and, he, and it was just funny because he starts bragging on his kid and how good his kid is. And he's from California, and he, uh, he built a dojo in his own house so his son could train and everything. And he's like, oh, well, here's my son right now. He's, my son's going to spar right now. And, and row, 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 row. And, well, little did he know his son was sparring my son, <laughs> Levi. And, uh, yeah, it was really fun. It was a great conversation. Um, because he said, you know, he, he asked me what I did. Well, at first he told me what he did. He was like an investment real estate guy in California. It's like uber money. And then he asks what, what we did. And that time we were in missions. So, you know, I told him that. And he's like, so what, are you like a priest? Right? Because he had no concept. So we talked and he, he even threw out questions like, so, so like, how does that work? Do, do people have to like pay each time they come on Sunday? Or is it more like, I'm thinking like, what, like a membership? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a monthly membership, kind of like the health club. If you use it, fine. If you don't, no. But he had no concept of what that was. So, so for him, if I was to bring up tithing, from a guy who, who knows money, he, he would have blown his mind. He would not have understood. And, and uh, so he had these great conversations, and he kept calling it mass. No, no, we don't do mass and, and things like that. But it was just interesting. So for us, tithing is something that we enjoy doing, right? It's a form of worship. People outside the church can't understand it. They think it's a, oh, you pay. You, you, they charge you. Oh, and then does it cost to get into heaven? Yeah, it costs, but Jesus paid that price and, and all that. And it's just, that was an interesting, funny story I just thought of. And, and, and if you guys were wondering, Levi just annihilated his son. <laughs> like, and uh, <laughs> that, was, that was a big tournament down in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was the world tournament. And uh, this, this, was the, this was the tournament after the world tournament. Right, so it was the beginning of the new season, and, and Levi actually took first place in sparring for his age, sparring kids from really all over the world. But yeah, I'm like, dojo, huh? <laughs> Could have put that money to something else, probably. Um, but it was fun. I don't know why I'm talking about that. It's just the fact that we have a different understanding of, of giving. And when we read verses like, man, God loves a cheerful giver, we're like, I get that. I like that. I like to be cheerful and, and all that. Well, let's pray and, and, and jump into this message here. It's a, it's a, it's a good one. Um, Father God, we do like to give. We like to give in all parts of our life. And Lord God, we really like to give in our finances, but we also like to give in our time and, and our effort and our understanding, and our dependence upon you, Lord God. So we give, we give ourselves away so we can be dependent on you. And, and Lord, we like that. So this idea of giving, it's, it's, it's amazing, Lord God. Help us to understand that deeper. And, and it's so weird to think that when we give, we, we understand and are able to live more in freedom. How does that work? We think... From a world standard, we have to take care of everything. But Lord God, when we rely upon you, that's where true freedom actually comes. Is that always the simplest, easiest thing to do in our lives? No, but it's always worth it. So Jesus, be glorified once again today. And everything that I speak from this pulpit today, be glorified. I, I ask you once again for those here today and those watching online, listening, Lord God, open hearts and work in lives. That's what we so completely desire. Holy Spirit, you're here. 
you're running the show. I don't want it to be about me. I want to talk about myself, my accolades, my accomplishments. That would be boring in comparison to being able to talk to you and what you've done in my life and, and are doing in, in the lives of people that are in this church and in this community. So Holy Spirit, allow me to speak what you have for me to speak and shut my mouth everything else. Help me to step aside from myself because I don't want myself. I want you. Like I always pray and I always believe. Holy Spirit, I ask that nobody leave here today the same way that they came in. Don't you agree with that? Who wants to, to leave here the same way that you came in? That would be crazy. So we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, our King, our Messiah. And everyone shouted out, Amen. Amen. Well, we've had, some, we've had some great Sundays lately, haven't we? I mean, we've had, you know, the last communion. I, I, really, I really liked the last communion service. And then, then we had baptism service. And man, people were getting into the baptism service. And, and, and I don't know, um, John McDougall mentioned this to me. He said, Pastor, I know we're not on a series, but every message just has fit together like it is a series. So... For whatever reason, I can't get away from series. Even when I try not to do a series, God orders it in such a way. Um, but man, I just feel like we've had some great Sundays. We've seen some, some stuff happen in people's lives. We as a body, we're growing. Our, our, uh, something's happening outside. Our parking lot seems to be shrinking because there's just not room for, for people anymore. When it started snowing last night, Amy's like, oh, it's like a winter wonderland. I'm like, but why on Saturday? It shouldn't be on Saturday. It just gives people a reason not to come to church. But thank you for coming this morning. Um, like I said, God's moving and he's moving in hearts and he's moving in this body. So can we just all agree together? Let's, let's agree to, to keep pursuing right let's keep worshiping and let's keep engaging just so we can see where god wants to take us what an adventure that is you guys agree with me that we're going to do that amen, amen. If you agree say amen, amen. If you disagree i don't know <laughs> say amen anyway so after all of that you know i thought man we've had some some great times we came out of the series we went into Christmas, then I had my surgery, then we've been doing this, this, this good stuff. I thought, hey, how about we just take it easy this Sunday morning? Anybody want to take it easy this morning? No. But that's what I named the message. No. I named the message easy. So, no. You know, people will joke with me. Andy would always joke with me. He's like, so when is that one Sunday coming up where we're going to take it easy? I'm like, I don't know when that'll be. Maybe that's today. Well, if you guys don't want to take it easy, we'll just have to see what happens. Let's jump right into Scripture this morning and see where it, it takes us. In your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy. If you don't quite know where that is, that's the, 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 all the way in the front. It's the fifth book of the Bible, so just go all the way to the front and... Uh, Go in five books and you're going to find that. We are going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 41. Look at what this says. Then you answered me. This is, this is Moses speaking, right? Then you answered me. We have sinned against the Lord. We ourselves will go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. And every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it easy to go up into the hill country. Some of you people in here are going, what in the world is he talking about? Well, we have to understand that the first part of the book of Deuteronomy is basically a recap of the Israelites leaving their captivity in Egypt. Remember the... the uh, We'll just read Genesis and it'll catch up. But the Israelites wound up in Egypt. They wound up being slaves. There was a whole bunch of them. And then, then Moses went and, and Moses, through a great, wonderful process, I'm telling you, read it, led them out of Egypt. And God's plan was to, to really free his people 
which he did by way of the exodus. And there's this cool part in the Red Sea where it parts, right? And then they have to cross through this wilderness. And God's plan was to lead them into the promised land. And the promised land was amazing. It was flowing with milk and honey. It had everything that they needed to succeed. See, God had orchestrated that. So all the, all the captive people had to do was to follow Moses, do what Moses said, follow the Lord, cross through the cool sea, right? Looking up and there's like fish there and all that. And then they get through and the army that was chasing him, the Egyptian army that was chasing him, tried to follow him, but then the sea caved back in, right? And now they're in the wilderness. All they had to do was cross the wilderness to get to the edge of the wilderness so they could walk into the promised land. But as most of you know, there was a snag. There's a little bit of a snag going on here. So they get up there and and they're like, well, we need to know what's going on. So Moses kind of agreed and he's like, okay, we'll send 12 spies. We're going to send 12 spies into the land to check it out, to see what's going on. And so these 12 spies went in and they, they came back and they testified that the Lord that had provided this land and that the land that God had for them was in fact amazing. It had all sorts of great stuff. I mean, it would have been like, this is the prime land. We're going to hardly have to do anything and we're going to be able to grow amazing crops. There's already buildings built. We can just move into those buildings and everything we put our hand to. This land is amazing. But the spies also said, however, however, it's full of big and scary people. And the Israelites Instead of trusting God, they actually refused to enter the land, believing that it would be too hard, but not without penalty. See, none of the adults except for Joshua and Caleb, who were two of the spies who came back and said, no, it doesn't matter if they're big and scary, we need to go in there. But there were ten other spies that convinced the people, they're too big and scary, it'd be just too hard for us to do. So none of the adults except for those two, Joshua and Caleb, who were the only ones who didn't rebel, they would not be allowed to enter the promised land. They're going to have to wander around the desert until they all die off, and we know that that took 40 years. See, God wasn't going to um, reward people that, that rebelled against him who didn't trust him. So that's what they did. They wandered around the wilderness until they died. Now, when they heard this, when they're sitting there and they're like, no, we don't want to go and it's too big and scary, and, and the pronouncement comes down, right? They are, they, uh, the punishment is, is, is told to them. They all of a sudden tried to backtrack. Aren't you glad we're so different? <laughs> oh, yeah, when we find out the actual consequence, we're like, well, that's not actually what I meant. That's not actually what I said. Let's, let's step back. I think we're miscommunicating here. I didn't actually say that, did I? But that's exactly what they said. So they're trying to pack track. And that's what verse 41 is all about. They're like, oh, well, um, no, we don't want to have to wander around and not enter the promised land. So we, we better go back and do what God asked us to do. And the key word for today is easy. Easy. See, the Israelites were consumed with easy. They wanted easy. They wanted everything done for them. They didn't want to have to face big and scary people and situations. They, they needed it to be easy. And their desire for easy caused them to rebel in the first place. And then when the consequences came down and they backtracked, they also wanted that to be easy. But they quickly found out it wasn't as God was not with them and the battle didn't go very good for them. God wasn't going to allow them to go in. God wasn't going to fight with them. Without a doubt for them as well as for us, easy is rarely the right or the best option. Think back in your life. How many times has, has taking the easy way out been the, the, the best route, right? Do the easy way so it can take twice as long. That's usually... That's usually what happens when I'm trying to do a project or anything. 
we see something that is somewhat opposite in, in nature, in the laws of nature. It's called the path of least resistance. And it's a term I first heard when talking about electricity. You know, we, you know, I'd be in science class and they'd start talking about the path of, of least resistance and how electricity is, is going to go in the, the shortest, least resistance way so you can shock your friend without getting shocked yourself, right? If you know how to, how to do that. I know some of you boys in here probably did that. Uh, the path of least resistance is the physical or metaphorical pathway that provides the least resistance to forward motion by a given object or entity among a set of alternative paths. That's the official definition. Really what it means is that electricity or any other moving thing will always take the easiest route the easiest being the one that provides the least amount of resistance. And we don't have to look very far around us um, in the natural world to see this principle apply to just about everything. You guys ever see a, a stream like this? Right? Why is it doing that? Because it wants to look pretty? No, because it wants to give Jason a great river to fish? I like to think so. But the reality is, is that water is finding the least resistance, right? It's just natural for that to do that. Gravity is pulling the water downhill, and the hills have different heights and different soil makeups. There's rocks, so that water is just meandering through there. It's quite pretty. It oxbows. It's, just, it's, it's a great thing. But that's an example of following the path of least resistance. In, in Kansas, and a lot of other places, farmers, they plant trees around their, their, their houses and their barns, right? They're going to do a, a tree line. It's called a windbreak, right? So now when the wind comes, it's easier for the wind to, to go around the buildings. So now that hog shed right there that looks like an H, all that smell can stay right there instead of being blown away. Now, in places like the Plains in Kansas, it, the wind blows all the time. It makes people crazy. The dirty 30s, man, it, they didn't have a lot of shelter bolts, and the topsoil blew away. So now farmers will always plant those lines, and those can take years to grow. But once they're established, it's great because the wind is going to take and follow the path of least resistance. It's going to give the, the, the landowner some peace and quiet, you know, you know, less air conditioning, less heat, less all of those things. Now, when it comes to seeing wildlife, if you like to hunt or, or go out looking, taking pictures, you know, you're going to quickly learn that you are going to be more likely to see wildlife along a game trail, right? A game trail like that. See, all animals, from the predators to the prey. Large animals, big giant grizzly bears and moose and elk and small animals, even like just the little bunnies and everything, they're going to use these highways in the forest. Why? Because they provide the path of least resistance. I remember when I worked on the north slope of Alaska and uh, the Dalton Highway, it is the, the only road from, from Fairbanks all the way up to Dead Horse, which is on the Arctic Ocean. It's on the Arctic Sea. And it was interesting because, you know, we would drive down this road and we would look out and there was, all, see, there's a pipeline right there and there's all this uh, wilderness, this great wilderness. And you would think, ooh, we should look into the wilderness to see the animals. No, the animals, they like the road. So sometimes we, you can only drive like 40 miles an hour on that road or you get your windshield bashed out. But there were times where where the traffic would be so bad because there'd be a herd of caribou. And that you would get up like almost right on, you would almost have to bump them to get them to get off the road. They're smart. Caribou, foxes, wolves, grizzlies, they all love that road. Um, because they know it's much easier to walk on that road than it is to walk in the trees or in the tundra. See, for the animals up there, they are literally taking the easy road, right? They're taking the easy road. For the natural world, it comes down to efficiency, right? But we also see this in the complex community of humans. Same principle, but 
Many times it's for very different reasons. We like to take the path of least resistance to, to save time, to save money, to save effort. And sometimes we take the easy road because of a lack of initiative, lack of ambition, or just plain laziness. And other times it's to avoid things like conflict or conviction. We do that in church on Sunday mornings. Conviction. Now that's, a, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Moral conviction is not, not something that can be explained by evolution or science, so there must be a spiritual explanation. And I'll tell you this, Holy Spirit conviction is never easy, and it's never the path of least resistance. So when you're sitting in church, or you're praying, or you're reading your word, and you feel that, that Holy Spirit conviction inside of you, and it's kind of kind of tearing at you. And, and you've got to understand that's, that's never easy. And it's going to require something out of you that's never the path of least resistance. In, time, in terms of good and evil, evil will always try to lead you down the path that you perceive as the easiest one. You ever found that true in your life? Evil always wants to make things easy for you. I say all of this simply because I want to be completely upfront with you. I want to be honest with you when I say choosing to follow Christ by a world or social standard is anything but the path of least resistance. Let's look at the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss. And there are many who enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow and difficult to travel is the path that leads the way to everlasting life. And there are few who find it. On my picture, if you can see that, you can see the escalators that are just crammed full of people going about because they didn't want to walk. There's just a few of them that are saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take the, the more difficult route. See, it's much easier to live within this fallen world, floating in the current, being swept wherever culture wants to take you. That's just, that's easy. That's not always the Christian message we hear, though, is it? See, we hear things like, hey, become a Christian and all your problems will disappear and you won't have to worry about anything. You know, I've been a follower of Christ for a long time. And I'm still waiting for that easy life that some people talk about. Anybody else in here waiting for that? They told me if I come to Jesus and just come to church on Sunday, everything would get easy. My life would be carefree. And it, that just doesn't always happen, does it? In fact, it doesn't usually happen. When it comes to Christ, we seldom see our problems disappear. And the easy life just isn't there. That's just reality. In fact, we find that living a life for Christ in a sinful and broken world can be anything but easy. But here's some more words from Jesus. John 16, I have said these things that to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's a lot going on here. We, we hear that and we like to, to, to speak that to people or we write it in a sympathy card and, and things like that. But there's really a lot going on. See, something we desperately need to understand is that peace does not equate to easy, right? Just because you have peace doesn't mean you have a life of ease. And that's the epitome of following Christ, right? Christ grants us peace so that we can live in a rough world. Christ grants us peace so we can deal with the hard times, the trials, and the tribulations in our life. Why? Because Christ has overcome all of those. We don't turn to Christ for easy, do we? That's a salesman's tactic, right? If anybody tries to, to tell you that, you'd be like, you got like a 
lemon of a car you want to sell me too? Maybe some oceanfront property in Arizona? You got that for me too? Because a lot of people, it's just like, we got to get them to pray the prayer, so let's tell them how easy their life will be. But we don't turn to Christ for easy. In reality, for the addict, it's easier to stay in addiction. It's just easier for them to stay in addiction. It's why they stay in addiction. It's a path of least resistance. For the angry, it's easier to stay offended. You know any of those people? They're angry all the time. It's easier for them just to stay in that place. Believing what the media tells you, well, that's easy. Isn't that easy? Well, they said it. I heard it on the news. I read it on Facebook. It must be true. Instead of doing any research, I'm just going to believe it. That's easy. They wouldn't lie to us, would they? Of course not. How about this one? How about this one? Doing what others want or expect you to do, that's actually easy. Now, is it beneficial? Very rarely. Is it the best thing for you? Is it glorifying to God? Not always, but doing what others expect you to do, that's easy. Again, the path of least resistance. Staying in your comfortable little bubble, your little box, that's absolutely easy. I just feel safe here. I just feel good. I don't know. I, I don't want to go out. I don't know what might happen. Yeah, but what might happen may be wonderful. I know it might be wonderful but it's so much easier just to stay in my comfortable little bubble. For the sinner, it's always easier to stay in sin. That's our human nature. Because in a sinful world, sin is easy. But sacrifice should never be easy. It wasn't for God. He had to send His only Son to die in order for there to be reconciliation. And with reconciliation comes righteousness. And it's righteousness that is hard for us. It's impossible, in fact, that is without Christ. That's the whole new covenant, isn't it? Following Christ takes effort and intention. It's not going with the flow. Rather, it's walking. It's straining against the current. It's standing firm. When the barrage of, of opinions and, and what the society is pushing at us and what the news media is telling us and, oh, you're a Christian, you're, you must be a Christian nationalist, you're a bigot, you're all of those things. Jesus is the only way. All of those things come against us. And if we don't stand firm, they're going to sweep us away. And I'm telling you, standing firm is not easy. See, it's following the call to be set apart and choosing to stand firm in that call. 1 Corinthians 15.58 says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, always doing your best and doing more than is needed, being continually aware that your labor, even to the point of exhaustion in the Lord, is not futile nor wasted. It is never without purpose. Does that sound easy? That doesn't sound easy to me. You know what sounds easy? Sitting on the couch, eating the, the orange Doritos. Not the blue ones. I don't like the blue ones so much, but the orange ones, just sitting on the couch, putting your feet up, kicking your shoes off, maybe having a cold drink, not caring about anything, not thinking about anybody else but myself and my Doritos. That's easy. Everything that Paul just said here, that does not sound easy. Steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, doing my best and doing more than is needed, being continually aware of my labor, even to the point of exhaustion. That just seems so tiring, doesn't it? The point of exhaustion just seems like that would make me worn out and tired. 
It's not easy stuff. Going above and beyond, which is what Paul is calling us to you, by its nature is the antagonist of easy. So if we don't turn to Christ for a life of ease, why do we turn to Christ? Well, we turn to him for forgiveness, for freedom, for faith, for hope, for love, for strength. And because of his mercy and his grace, it's because of Christ's sacrifice. See, all of these things, they've been done for us. God did those things for us. They are, they are gifted to us from God himself. They are available to us. However, however, as many quickly realize, they can be anything but easy to receive and to actually live out. Right? So though he did all these things for us, our part is actually receiving them, implementing them, applying them, and then living them out. He did the hard stuff. He's just asking us to participate. And for some people, that's still not easy enough. Again, we live and we exist in a fallen and sinful world. This environment is corrupt and it's infected with sin. To receive from God and to walk with Christ is in violent opposition to this world. You've, if you don't remember anything else today, which, man, I hope you remember more than just this today. But if you don't remember anything else, please remember this statement. To, re um, to receive from God and walk with Christ is in violent opposition to this world. Where does that leave you as a believer? You're in violent opposition to this world. See, it's much easier to sinfully exist in a sinful environment. And you know this to be true. Look at Romans 8, 6, and 7. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. That's why many of you were so opposed to Jesus and to church at one time or another in your life. Can you remember back then? For some of you, it probably wasn't that long ago. For some of you, it's been like most, man, it's so far back there you can barely remember. But there was a time in your life where you were opposed to both Jesus and to church. But what is perceived as easy now is actually tragic for eternity. And speaking of church, speaking of church, let's just let's go down that road. Won't that be fun this morning? From an outsider's perspective, church is weird. What we are doing this morning, for all the people that are at Home Depot and Lowe's working on projects, it's weird. They don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. Why? Because it's an impractical use of time. That's what they see this as. It's an impractical use of time. It's much easier to sleep in and then to have brunch than to actually have to wake up and get the snow off your car, start your car early, put your boots on, drive here, come in, walk all the way from the parking lot into the building, and then find a seat. So much easier just to not come to church. And then there's all the, there's all the standing and singing. What's that all about? You guys have to stand and sing too? Is that like a requirement? And then the preaching. The preaching just seems to go on forever, doesn't it? And everybody said, no, you didn't. And, and, and here's one. How about, how about all those hypocrites that are filled in their little church building who think they are better than everyone else? Not to mention all those, those just absolutely wacky people. You walk into a church like Bridge, there's all these wacky people that want to come up to you and introduce themselves to you. 
and they want to talk and actually get to know you, it's so much easier just to avoid all of those things. See, from the outside, it looks like that because there's an absence of Christ. And it's taking the easy road. Unchurched people can't understand why church can be so valuable because they have put no value in Jesus. And that's due to various reasons, like, like never opening themselves up, never, never accepting an invitation to church, never going beyond what other unbelievers have told them about church, being stuck in a, a religious mode. Well, I went to church when I was little, so all church must be that. And, and maybe I went to a church and it just was, was weird. They were saying really bad stuff and... And uh, maybe they're stuck in that religious mode and they never want to try to get out of that rut. Never wanting to leave their sin. It's another reason people won't walk into church. And most of the time it's just because they want easy. And they think not coming on a Sunday morning is easier. Because it's just easier not to go. And that's the unchurched and the de-churched crowd, right? Those are people that have never actually committed to church for a, a segment of time and, and um, experienced what true church actually is, what a true relationship with Jesus actually is. But then we also see some Christians taking a more easy and selfish route in, in, in their faith because... Because easy and selfish always go together, don't they? And they take this easy and selfish attitude toward church. And we live in a society that's, that's bought into so many lies, and those lies have seeped into the church. And the mentality can quickly become, well, I need a church that meets my needs. I'm going to shop around till I find a church that I can check all, the, all my requirements off of. The church needs to meet my needs. Instead of saying, how can I help church become more of the body? What's easier? What's easier? It's easier to put up all these requirements and then never find a church that's worthy of your attendance. That's easy. Going to church and saying, you know what? There are certain things here that, that I don't love, but there's a whole lot of people that I do love. There's certain things that, that maybe have happened or, or in the past have happened. There's certain memories I have. But it would be too easy to not come to church because of those things. Instead, I'm deciding to walk against the current. I'm going to go to that church. I'm going to be the best church attender, and I'm going to help build that body it's a lot harder thing to do. So why do we do such a thing? Making up all these excuses. Because it's easy. Haven't you guys been listening? Because it's easy. Hey, you guys remember? <laughs> Jen, you remember, right? You remember the Lionel Richie song? Easy like Sunday morning, right? No, we're not going to do that song in here this morning. <laughs> See, I hope Sunday mornings here aren't described as easy, right? I, I hope they're not. Sunday mornings should be engaging and Sunday mornings should be challenging. I want Bridge Assembly to be the easiest church to walk into on a Sunday morning. But I don't want the message, I don't want the worship, I don't want any of that to be so easy that it makes no impact, that it makes no change, that it brings no conviction. So we want church to be easy to walk into, but we want everybody that leaves this church to leave differently, to not leave the same way that they came in. And again, that's not easy. You're something else to think about. And I thought about this one a lot and it dawned on me and I, and I really pondered on this one and, and it just made a whole lot of sense to me. Have you noticed in the past oh, several years, really, from the 
Hollywood crowd to the the entertainment crowd, just to the general crowd, that that atheism is no longer the in thing. Like atheism isn't really the cool thing anymore. It's like you got these stuffy philosophers and scientists that are really weird, cosmic people, and they're they're atheists, right? But really for the general public, atheism is no longer the in thing. See, many people are seeking and want to believe in something, they want to believe in anything. They want to believe that, that it's just nothing. So they want to believe in something. So I ask myself, so, so why are other religions and some other denominations getting this newfound popularity? Look out there, there's a lot of, of, of religions and denominations and all of a sudden they're 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 popular now they're they're kind of cool and here's what i believe i believe those are gaining popularity because they are based on works so many are based on works and works makes us feel good about ourselves doesn't it don't works make us feel good about ourselves they absolutely do do things to make God happy, whoever that God is to you, and then in return, he will make you happy. Oh, that's easy. A religion based upon works allows us to do the least amount of work that we have to do. It's the conflicting notion that you can all at once do what God wants and still live life on your own terms. Now that's easy. Now that's the path of least resistance. You mean if I trade off going to an hour and a half on Saturday night or Sunday morning and sit in, in the church and then God will be pleased with me? I'll, 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 that'll be my works toward Him and then in return He'll bless me and let me do whatever I want. So then, then the rest of the five and six and seven eighths days of the week I can do whatever I want I can sin I can do all of those things that's easy wouldn't that be great no it wouldn't be great that's the path people are looking for the easiest path but that's not Jesus's path we do not live on our own terms we follow Christ and in our walk we put in effort and time and energy and focus And yes, sacrifice. And it's not to our detriment. See, when we're truly following Christ, we offer Him all these things. It's like like two guys that, what time did you get here this morning, for goodness sakes? To shovel. What? It was before seven, I know that. Mark, were you here too? Dave came. And it's like, oh, this wonderful snow on a Saturday night. It's my favorite time for it to snow, Saturday night. Lord, thank you for the moisture. That's what we always say. Thank you. It's good moisture. But it causes problems. And we, again, want to make it easy to get into the building, right? So we have guys, and they get up early on a Sunday morning instead of sleeping in and having brunch, and they come up and they shovel, and they make it right. And there's, there's things like that. It takes energy, effort, time, and focus. And, and you sitting here and not falling asleep through my messages, that takes energy and focus and caffeine and all of those things. Just the fact of, of getting up in the morning and driving to church, as silly as that sound, it takes focus, time, energy. Getting in your Bibles throughout the week, Focus, time, energy, praying. Focus, time, energy, effort, sacrifice. See, sacrifice is never easy. If sacrifice were easy, it wouldn't be called sacrifice. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 2, 12. So then, my dear ones, just as you have always obeyed my instructions with enthusiasm, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. That is, cultivate it. Bring it to full effect. Actively pursue spiritual maturity with awe-inspired fear and trembling, using serious caution and critical self-evaluation to avoid anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. That is anything but a gentle, meandering 
life of ease. It's effort. It's working out. It's like, oh my goodness, you got to do the instructions with enthusiasm and, and we got to cultivate it and we got to bring it into full effect. We've got to actively pursue spiritual maturity. You just come to church every Sunday and you sit there like a bump on a log. Don't think your spiritual maturity is going to do anything but fall backwards, right? It's, it's maturity. Maturity takes effort. Effort isn't easy. Don't stay an immature believer. Put effort into your faith. Now here's the good news. Here's the good news. Don't despair. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to help us. Mm. It's like God says, hey Jason, metaphorically you need to lift that giant boulder. And I say, God, don't you know that I have a brand new shoulder and I can't lift anything for another two weeks? And God says, yeah, I know that. That's why I sent the Holy Spirit. You just got to engage the Holy Spirit within your life to help. The Holy Spirit lifts the boulder. We're like the little kid that's helping dad going, oh, I lifted it. We got to engage the Holy Spirit because Jesus sent that Holy Spirit because Jesus knew that our life would not be easy. How did Jesus know that our life would not be easy? Because he lived a life here on earth. He lived a life here on earth like none of us will ever live. He died a death that none of us will ever die. He was rejected by everyone from his family to the Pharisees to his followers. Jesus understands that life won't be easy. So Jesus has sent his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to guide us, to help us, to rely upon him. See, when we accept Jesus into our life, when we make that decision to live for him, he deposits the Holy Spirit into us. And we can now hear what he has to speak to us. But remember, the ability to hear starts with a desire to listen. The ability to hear always starts with a desire to listen. So make yourself available to listen by opening yourself up to his word. Why, why did, I, I didn't hear God, Pastor. I prayed and I didn't hear God. Oh, yeah, what are you reading in the Bible? The Bible is what really speaks to us, right? The Holy Spirit also speaks to us through prayer and, and, and things like that. But it's his word is his primary mode to speak to us. Again and especially, learning all of this, trying all this out, discovering all this at first, it's not easy. But after that, it's still not that easy because it takes time, effort, focus, sacrifice. But man, we got to have it. We got to have our time with Jesus, right? We got we to gotta rely upon the Holy Spirit for all our decisions. It takes time, effort, attention, it takes focus. So don't buy into the lie of an easy life. There is no easy life, whether you be a Christian or not. Well, I just won't go to church and then I'll have an easy life. No, you'll have a horrible life. You'll have a rotten life. You'll have a terrible life. You guys understand that because you've lived that life sometime in the past. Let's end with some verses. These are verses, I didn't put them up. I'm just going to read them to you. Mark them down. That's why I left a spot on your thing for notes. Write these down. Revisit them. Study them. Speak them. Do whatever. But we want to end with these verses, not just to to speak them out, but to make ourselves available to the words that are being spoken here. Amen? We're going to start out with Luke 9.23. Luke 9.23, it says this, And Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Pretty easy, huh? The gist of this is is that on a daily basis, we need to die to ourselves so that we can follow Christ and he can live within us. Not a one time, hey, I prayed the prayer the one time and now I'm good. No, this is Jesus saying you need to do this every single day. Every single day. If you would like to come after me, you need to deny yourself and you need to take up your cross and follow me 
every day. Yeah, but it's Sunday. It's my vacation day. It's, I'm going to take Monday off because I need a break. Well, that's fine. You can have a break from all of that stuff. But you don't take a break from this. It's not easy, but it's important. Let's look at Matthew 16, 25. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Now I've got to lose my life. That ain't easy. What about all these things in my life that I so love? I love to, to hang on to. It's, there's little sins over here and just distractions over here. And I, I like to hang on to those things. Jesus say, no, no, you need, to, you need to lose that. You need to lose that in order to, to actually save your, your life. Again, not easy. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. This is a good one. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. This is going to speak to somebody in here this morning. I know it. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say seven times, but 70 times seven. Well, I forgave that person. Yeah, and you picked it right back up. Well, I forgave him again, and you picked it up again. But how many times do we got to go around this circle? How many times do I have to actually forgive that person that I'm still not going to like? Until it finally takes. Until it finally takes. Matthew 5, 43 and 44. Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Oh, that's easy. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put that one right at the top of my list because I like to do the easy stuff first and get to the hard stuff later. So I'm going to put this one at the top because it's easy to love my enemies and it's easy to pray for those who persecute me. It's terrible. That's hard. It's almost impossible. It's only made possible through the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. How about Matthew 10, 34 through 39? This one will get you crazy. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is all about compromise, isn't it? Oh, but to keep peace in the household, I won't bring Jesus up ever. Oh, it's Thanksgiving? No religion or politics. Well, don't come to my house because Thanksgiving is about being thankful for what God did in our lives. It's going to cause a problem. It's not easy. You want the easy way out? I don't know, go sell ice cream and, and balloons. But then the balloons pop and the ice creams pop off and those people are going to be mad anyway. You might as well stand firm in what needs to be stand, stood in, right? And that's Jesus himself. So we're going to go through life and we're going to have family members and we're going to have friends and we're going to have neighbors that despise us because of our love for Christ. It's called conviction is what it really is, but they're going to despise us because we're religious, we're Bible thumpers, we're whatever. And Jesus is saying here, don't compromise, don't take the path of least resistance, don't take the easy road, stand firm in me, even if it causes you to lose people in your life, even if it fractures relationships, stand firm in me first. And then I will have the ability to use you to speak into that life. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. This is awesome. Love this about Paul. Brothers, I do not consider 
that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on forward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Straining, pushing forward. Worship team, come on up. Not easy, but more than worth it. Not easy, but more than worth it. So now we come to the easy part of the service called the response time. It's when all that conviction is built up in our lives. It's when, it's when you know, the, the, the Word itself, Scripture, is spoken to us. It's when, when the Holy Spirit has got things reminding us of things, of anger, of unforgiveness, of, of uh, wanting to take the path of least resistance, of, of doing things because it's easy, of not doing things because it's easy. See, that all comes down to right now. And, and really, it's right now. Right now in the service that that most of the time determines on if we're going to leave this building the same way we came in, or if we're going to leave differently. Go ahead and turn turn the lights down. We want to give everybody an opportunity to just ask themselves the simple question, God, have I taken the easy road? And if I have, has that been to the detriment of my faith in any way, shape, or form? And we ask that 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 honest question right before God. And then God, through the Holy Spirit, is going to give you an honest answer. And with that answer, then you have to make the decision to take the easy road and not do anything about it, or take the somewhat harder road and do something about it. Of course, our altars are going to be open and there are going to be people that want to pray with you. Maybe you need to get down and you just need to, to ask for forgiveness or, or you need to repent or you just need to try to get things straightened in your life. Maybe you're stuck in a cycle of ease. And maybe that's just to, to uh, appease people or because you're afraid. Fear is a big reason we take the path of ease. Maybe we've never had that true interaction with Jesus. He's our Lord and Savior abstractly, but have you ever really gotten before Him and and accepted Him fully into your life? Again, not the easy route, but the important route. So as we close, we're going to sing a song about having victories over the hardships in your life, right? Hardships. They don't call them easy ships, do they? They Call them hardships because they're hard to go through. They're hard to go through, but they're worth going through the hard times because we draw closer to Jesus in that. So I'm going to pray like always. These altars will be open like always. The decision falls upon you like always to either leave here the same or to allow the Holy Spirit in and to leave here differently. Let's get this life of ease get that out of your head and instead think about a life of worth Jesus Jesus calls us to a life of worth and in that worth he brings us peace but that peace takes focus, sacrifice effort, time, all of those things. So everybody stand up with me if it's not too hard I'm going to pray. And then we're going to open these altars. We're going to worship. Man, I'd invite you to worship like you've never worshiped before. Press in. Put in that effort. Come to the altar. Maybe you've never come to the altar before. It's not an easy thing, I know. It's horribly hard the first several times. But I would encourage you to do just that. Father, we thank you that you love us so much not to relegate us to a life of ease. Father, we thank you that you trust us enough not to shove us back into some corner of a life of ease. Father, we thank you that you have given us purpose. You have given us a calling in this life. Jesus, we thank you for everything that you accomplished on the cross. And with that... set up the ability to stand with you and to stand against this world. And Jesus, you know from 
from your experience, life here is not easy, and we can never even comprehend what you had to go through. But Lord God, you understand, so you give us the Holy Spirit, which grants us the discernment and the energy and the ability to stand against the cultural current and the sinful world that bears down upon us every single day. Day. So, Jesus, we proclaim you, Lord and Savior, in our life. We proclaim you, Lord and Savior, in this church. And we boldly state that no matter what culture brings against us, no matter what the world brings against us, no matter what the enemy brings against us, we will, with focus, sacrifice, and effort, stand against those things that are apart from you dying to ourself every day, forgiving as you forgave us, pressing on toward the goal. Jesus, it's all about you, and you make it possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in the bold, mighty, powerful, authoritative name of Jesus Christ. And everyone shouted, Amen. Amen. The altars are open. This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.